Thank you, Doug, and again, I'd like to also thank the uh, organizers and, of course, Elsie for, for supporting this work. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes or so is give you some insight into a body of work uh, from a very dedicated group. It took a while to get um, some consensus on some of these issues that relate to reporting requirements uh, for flavonoid research. It was the flavonoid committee at the time. It is now broader as bioactives, but it really is, um, I would say, a statement towards taking multiple recommendations across how to do studies and really applying it to the context and the unique nature of what flavonoid research is. So with that, I um, have to do the legal part that we always do. These are my disclosures uh, from advisory roles and research funding. We do work with industry uh, because we find that working with industry, even in the flavonoid world, is a good way to think about how we translate to consumers. Um, that being said, the research, and we heard for how many days, three days now, the research related to flavonoid rich foods, diets, and, and their impact to human health. And where we want to be, I think where we want to talk at the end of this session is really about development of evidence-based dietary guidance. And as it relates to designing and reporting of research studies, there's so many aspects of these things, as Doug said really well, which the heterogeneity in the studies have really complicated the conversation. So what we're trying to do is get to a point where we can and say, make some recommendations that allow us to have those discussions and rationalize and evaluate the literature critically to get to a point that's meaningful for the, the public. So if I had to characterize four of the main areas that came out of the discussions um, from the Flavonoid Committee and, uh, and the paper that will be uh, published on this, it would be related to, of course, things that are very common and we've heard a lot about in the last few days. Definition and assessment of materials. So how do we characterize the materials that we use? The development of databases specifically for intake to get a good, accurate estimate of the actual flavonoid intake in the public. And Jeff's going to be speaking really about more about the database aspects uh, with this. And then, of course, the design of human clinical studies. What considerations uh, should be made at least at a minimum and optimally in terms of design and, and reporting of outcomes. But also critically uh, is the other side of the clinical, which is often probably just as important in terms of deciding and understanding the mechanism of action. How do we design uh, preclinical studies related to studying MOA, and so that way we can begin to understand outcomes from, from clinicals. So I will focus on, the, on a few of the guiding documents that the committee used in, in putting together these recommendations with the flavonoid flavor, if you will. One, um, it is, uh, I should say, US-centric, uh, but it is guidance from an NIH workshop uh, on designing, implementing, and reporting clinical studies from soy interventions, where Marguerite Klein is the main author and, and Connie Weaver. And a lot of good guidance in this document specifically related to flavonoids in terms of handling, reporting, and uh, how to design uh, intervention studies. But then, one that I think many of you who do clinical studies are very familiar with, the Consort Standards Reporting Trials document, uh, which was really at the heart of making sure that recommendations are consistent with recommendations for randomized clinical trials. To so create these trials, of course, from the standpoint of transparency in reporting, in design, and facilitate, uh, let's say, analysis of outcomes across trials, which is, as Doug mentioned, a problem in some cases with, with uh, what we're doing from the standpoint of flavonoids. So I'll start really talking about the material question because it's one that's near and dear to my heart. And we've heard a lot about cocoa in the last few days, and this is a paper in cardiovascular pharmacology from Robbins that I think the quote says it all uh, in terms of where we start out sometimes. Really underpinning the studies required to establish the relationship between the consumption of flavanol-rich foods and cardiovascular health is the need to have specific flavanol composition data for the foods employing these studies. Um, that is a critical piece. It's not enough to just feed, but you have to know what you're, what you're using. And so the aspects of really defining those materials, but not just the materials, the context in which they're used, really there's several gaps uh, that we see in the literature as it is currently being reported. And some of that is, of course, in its use of inconsistent terminology and nomenclature for the compounds. 
but also for the plant materials that are typically studied, the analytical methodologies that are applied, and then of course definitions of test materials or foods. Um, it's one of those situations where I myself, having training as a food scientist, um, have to work better at sometimes at communicating how we define foods ourselves. Um, and of course, the description really of the matrix effect. Food is a, a whole matrix, and we've heard a lot about synergy in the last few days between the matrix, between the flavonoids and their delivery, and of course their activity. So if you think about that complexity, that's what we're dealing with in terms of gaps. In terms, not that people are not doing the research correctly, but they may not be reporting it in full, and that's important. Uh, we do have some guidance in, in how to do this. NCAM from NIH, National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, has guidance for natural product integrity. And a lot of what is applied in, in, our, in our study of these really comes from NCAM, really on how we describe complex botanical products, natural products, how they are used, not only in clinical, but preclinical studies. NCAM applies rigor as well at all levels of studies to make sure that there is consistency, and it's a good lesson, lesson to learn. A little bit of a headache if you've had to deal with them, but it's, uh, it's very valuable. Um, it is really also guidelines for establishing product integrity and quality assurance across the course of your study. Uh, it allows um, to make sure that we are in fact dosing what we think we are dosing uh, and that we have stable products that are suitable for studies. And this is something that is very recent. I would say the FDA guidance for many of you, Federal Drug Administration in the U.S. has a new guidance on investigative new drugs that was effective as of September 13th, the guidance document that was released. And this is uh, now for, for many who don't want to follow some of the guidance that was, let's say, out there for a good practice. There is more, um, how should I say, motivation in the sense that the FDA is beginning to define anything beyond uh, food, anything beyond taste, aroma, or nutritive value becomes a drug uh, and because the primary purpose has changed. Uh, and, and so in its study now, anyone doing work on flavonoids for benefits beyond basic nutritive value in fact have to apply for an investigative new drug application which requires many of these definitions and, of, and, and issues that we'll discuss. And I thought it was very interesting that the, one of the clear examples they used was study of the effect of soy isoflavones on bone metabolism is now a drug. So we're dealing with, uh, with, with the, the outcome from that in the future. So what are some of these key assessment pieces from NCAM and others? It's really identifying and characterizing and properly using taxonomic nomenclature for botanical sources. Not, I would say, casual uh, language to describe these foods, but pure taxonomic nomenclature, including also then supply, source, batch, et cetera, from commercial sources clearly designated um, in the reporting of the studies that you do. Uh, many of you, of course, do this. I've seen wonderful examples of this throughout the week. Um, common definition of flavonoids. Uh, as, as silly as it sounds, uh, we, are, we still struggle sometimes with the nomenclature. And use of established nomenclature is key to be able to select the studies and documents quickly for comparison, as well in methodologies applied in measuring them. Advanced methodologies that are very high specific are available, uh, but sometimes uh, they're not always the best, so choice of the appropriate one is, is there. Um, food matrix intervention forms, and I think here we often see reports of detailed composition for flavonoids, but not as detailed relative to the matrix that they're in in total. So the more information that can be provided relative to the research materials, the nutritional composition, and the presence of other bioactive compounds, whether they're smaller molecule phenolics, more complex phenolics, carotenoids, tocopherols, et cetera, it's important to identify what else may be interfering, uh, or I should say complicating your analysis of, that, of those outcomes. And then, of course, stability. This is, a, this is an issue that is, that is critical and not, uh, I would say, addressed well enough uh, across the board, which is, really understanding over a 12-month or 18-month study how stable the materials that you're using are and are people actually getting the doses that they need to be getting. Assessment and reporting of that is really critical. As I mentioned before, I don't think anyone needs to see the flavonoid structure here, but the point basically saying that there are established nomenclatures, numbering systems for the rings that allow us to have common terminology. We need to enforce its use more and apply it more readily uh, in our research so that way we can have the same conversations. We really should avoid broad terms, antioxidants, phenolics. I know the title of the, of the conference, Congress here is International Congress on Polyphenols, but when we're talking flavonoids, it is a specific class. 
Uh, use of standardized nomenclature, appropriate subclasses, are they A-glycones, are they glycosides, be as specific as possible, and in some cases where it's appropriate to the degree of, the, of uh, polymerization, if many of the oligomers and polymers, if it can be characterized, should be reported. Um, for quantitative data, what's actually kind of interesting is actually hydrolyzing or using A-glycone um, a glycone equivalents is a great way to compare across studies. Uh, and so this is something that we often struggle having to do conversions on our own when we're trying to develop that, which means we get to the analytics and what are we really talking about? We've heard a lot of detail on specific and non-specific methods and we've heard that, for example, ORAC and some of the other antioxidant assays are a little out of favor. Uh, we do tend to favor and, and recommend the high use of specific assays, but to a large extent, non-specific assays can be very useful to capture, for example, what you may be missing in a very highly specific flavonoid analysis. It goes back to the other components. So a balanced use of these is critical, but certainly the specific assessment to be able to give detailed speciation data is important. And this is some example of applying those methodologies for stability of archival materials. The grapeseed extract that uh, uh, Jim Simon's group has, uh, you know, at Rutgers University has been analyzing for some neuroprotective uh, studies going on at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and we're able over 12 months, this material is coded, archived at minus 80, and analyzed every month to determine its stability, and we're able to follow by HPLC and then summarize, or I would say uh, total, the total monomer content and then oligomer content to see that the grape seed extract, for the most part, is remaining stable over the study period. Uh, seems trivial, but it's rather important. Another key aspect is in the experimental conditions. This is an example of the same grapeseed extract put into drinking water for animal studies. And what you find is general stability over the first day and a half, two days, and then a rapid drop off. It gives you guidance in terms of how to do, uh, how often things need to be changed, et cetera, to ensure proper dosing. These are key to what we're, we're really doing, ensuring the quality of the studies. Another example, we'll hear more from Carl Coco, but specific methodologies we've seen to, uh, at this meeting can help you identify changes to processing the foods, the roasting and alkalization of cocoa, converting the more bioavailable negative epicatechin to negative catechin, which has very low bioavailability. So are we still talking about the same product if it's processed for the degree of processing? And these are what these methods do. So uh, Jeff will be talking a lot more about databases. And so the key thing I wanted to mention there is these methodologies are critical to help populate those databases, to help us get accurate numbers for real intake determination, which then flows its way over to design and controls uh, for human studies. So I'll briefly touch on some aspects of human studies, really about the test materials. We've already talked about those, but really defining them more clearly. Are we dealing with foods, extracts, preparations? Are we dealing with single compounds, mixes? Clearly define these and then report them. Uh, the nature of the test food or the product um, really talking about are we using commercially standardized products, are you using what I would call homemade extracts, which are not as easy to characterize and standardize. This is where we need to get to more standardized materials for testing and of course that is a direction that we're going. Uh, nature of the control product, I'm not here to debate whether it should have flavonoids in it or not, but it needs to be well matched in censoring quality attributes. And it is, you know, is it expected to be consumed in the context of the diet? And what are the basal levels of flavonoids if included? And are they stable and available in the same way? These are all things that should be reported. Relative to participants, much is the same what you would see in the consort document, defining and clearly stating eligibility, exclusion criteria, rationale. Uh, key thing, we've heard a lot of different studies this week about either high consumers or non-consumers of flavonoids. Uh, which is quite nice to be able to compare those. Are we studying and looking in healthy populations, at risk, disease states? All of these things need to be clearly reported and outlined. I know I'm preaching to the choir. It's just one of those things that we often need to be reminded of. Um, also, this is a big one, and this is where databases really come into play. Background levels. When is it appropriate to begin to look at proper controls, including a background level of flavonoids? And, and applying that to try to make the study more relevant for dietary guidance. Um, of course, citing and assessing um, and or assessing bioavailability in the test food, in similar foods, how might it be changed, how might it be influenced by food formulation, these are all factors that must be considered and if possible, assessed. 
um, prior to. We've heard a lot of the complexity related to the bioavailability this week, and I think this highlights some of the other key challenges, that what we consume is not what we see in the body. And of course, I think when you, when you start, Alan, I think Alan Crozier said it exactly, which is, you know, wrong form, wrong dose. And that's exactly where we are in many cases when we're studying uh, preclinical work. But consideration of how your treatment may change the absorption and metabolism is, is important. Acute versus long-term interventions, we, we've seen reported in the literature changes by exposure and adaptation to bioavailability and metabolism. So clearly reporting what the running periods are, um, what the health status of the individual and whether they had a washout or not is important to be able to compare studies. Consumption frequency, how many times a day because of the half-life. Um, and then of course, uh, compliance markers. Those can be developed in individuals, more total flavonoid assessment, uh, or using individual metabolites derived from the flavonoid materials themselves. So it's one thing to think about how we study in humans, but then going back to mechanism of action, those same factors complicate what we do there. So just to summarize the animal studies, and these are what we learn when we're students. Obviously, understanding how different species handles and handle and process these. And I think the one that comes to mind the most from studies that I read, studies that I've even been part of, are the dose relevances to humans. Often not reported uh, completely. You will see, for example, a lot of dose reporting in milligrams per kilogram body weights without comparison to what human equivalent doses might be. And I think these are important parameters that should be often uh, included. Uh, back to the comment of moving it to cellular models for mechanisms of action. We know the forms differ, and we know the concentrations and the, the physiological concentrations differ from that in food. So wrong form, wrong amount, these are factors that need to be considered moving into the studies. But really the challenge there is the lack of commercial availability of the metabolite uh, standards. And so I want to end up just with a slide on this. We, we heard a lot of synthesis work, beautiful synthesis work of metabolite standards. And we also know that we're out there and individuals are confirming those structures. And oftentimes those data are published, but a lot of times they're also put in supplementary information. It's important to take and do the best you can to publish these data. They are important. This is an example from Rick Dixon's group, which really looked at uh, enzymatic synthesis of substituted epicatechins, uh, so he could do the studies uh, on uh, neurodegeneration. And it wasn't enough just to get the mass spectra, but they actually published the 2D NMR characterization, very important for people then to be able to replicate those studies, gain the same materials, and do the same studies. So obviously positively confirming some of the structures. More of that is needed. And so just to sum up, apply consistency in reporting according to standardized flavonoid nomenclature. If we at least try to speak the same language, I think we'll go, we go a long way. Uh, sourcing in QC is important. Characterization of, of the material is foremost important. And uh, I would say we need to extend it beyond other bioactive compounds, I mean, beyond flavonoids to all bioactives that we can catalog in these foods. Um, ironic that the flavonoid committee is not bioactive. Um, development of appropriate controls for flavonoid materials, this is a discussion that needs to move forward. What are we really going to compare it against? I think this would be a challenge. And then development and characterization of metabolite standards to get into the mechanism of action studies. So with that, I'll end. just wanted to thank co-authors of this talk and paper and see North American organisms. Thanks. <laughs>